Let's Talk is brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network and is made possible by our many generous patrons. If you'd like to support the podcast, please visit sqpn.com slash give. You're listening to Let's Talk, episode 46, brought to you by the StarQuest Production Network. Howdy all, Father Corey Stika. Welcome to Let's Talk, our SQPN community podcast. Glad you could join us. Uh, once again this week, we only have uh, another panelist, but it's someone who's new to Let's Talk, but not new to an SQPN podcast. She was actually on our Secrets of Technology not that long ago and is a regular panelist now on Secrets of Technology. Pat, why don't you introduce yourself so people can find out who you are. Hi, I'm Pat Scott from Austin, Texas. And I'm otherwise known as the mama nerd. So uh, <laughs> that's where I get into the tech stuff. But um, been Catholic since I was six years old, raised a family of four kids and have been married for more than 50 years. And so here I am with that background of experience. <laughs> uh, that's, that's a good thing. That's a very good thing. Now, there's a connection to Dom, our CEO. Oh, what might yes. that be? He married my daughter. So he is my beloved son-in-law. And he's ah, been well, really, really good for to be in the family. We really enjoy him. Well, that's good. I, I'm glad you said beloved son-in-law, not hated son-in-law. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no way. <laughs> he made my daughter happy. That's the main thing. <laughs> that's a very good thing. No, it's, it's good to have you both here on Let's Talk and on uh, uh, Secrets of Technology. I know we had a good discussion. We were on, it was a couple of weeks ago, I think, we were on together. Right. And yeah. we had a good discussion. So, Well, thank uh, you for having me. Yeah, glad to have you. Well, as I mentioned last week, we're we're talking about the events of uh, Holy Week, starting with last week, we talked about Palm Sunday and the Passion. This week, we're going to talk about Holy Week itself going into Easter, uh, because, of course, this is a very busy time of year uh, here in the church. And so, and of course, there's a lot of meaning and symbolism, you know, again, with everything that's going on. Now, as we'll be in the middle of Holy Week, as this gets released, getting ready to celebrate Holy Thursday, Good Friday, priests will be pulling their hair out, liturgists will be going nuts, musicians will be practicing and to their point where their voice almost hoarse, but we'll be ready. And, you know, for myself, uh, Holy Week is always a very joyful experience. I don't know about you, Pat, what, you, what your experience of it is. Well, the first Holy Week I remember uh, after we converted as and when I was six years old was my birthday fell on Good Friday. Oh, and so my birthday, I didn't get any cake. I didn't get any presents, but I got a <laughs> missile of my very own, which I actually have right here. <laughs> oh, wonderful. So, <laughs> anyway, that was my introduction to Holy Week. But in more recent years, for about 20 years, I've been in a choir. And we do very traditional music, very uh, a lot of Latin, a lot of classical stuff, as well as some more oh, modern. Wonderful. And so, yes, the we felt like we needed to put a cot in the uh, the uh, sacristy so we'd have a place <laughs> to sleep because there wasn't much rest during Holy Week. But it is exhilarating; it's yeah. emotionally draining, and yes. uh, I always look forward to it. This will be the first year I actually haven't been in the choir during Holy Week, so I'm interested to see how things look from the pew side oh, and sure. uh because it's been a long time so anyway that's oh, yeah. my background oh wonderful yeah I, I've, I've done the choir and yeah it's it, it is a lot of work to to prepare for that and then of course again as a priest you know and i've actually gotten the point kind of you know kind of you know pull back the veil a little bit you know where i just focus on what's the next liturgy right you know so when Holy Thursday ramps up, my focus is on Holy Thursday. What do I need to do? What do I need to set up? What do I need to get ready for Holy Thursday? And then as soon as Holy Thursday mass is over, then we focus on Good Friday. You know, well, and that's a good way to do it. <laughs> you know, because because if you if you try to focus too much on the whole week, it can be over. It is overwhelming. There is so much that goes on liturgically. There's so much that goes on spiritually. Like you said, it, it's it's draining, but it's it's draining in a good way because it's it's such a powerful week 
you know, we talked last week about Palm Sunday and the Passion, where that Mass, you go from the the the, the glory of the, the triumphal entrance of our Lord to the Passion, the, the, the pain of the Passion. Well, now this whole week is kind of that, but extended out. But we, again, we go from, you know, Holy Thursday, we've got our Lord's Supper to Good Friday, his, his Passion death, and then Easter Sunday, his resurrection. You know, so it really is it's a wonderful thing. And I, I highly recommend, you know, if, you're, if you haven't done, those who are listening, if you haven't done the Holy Week, the entire Holy Week, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Easter Vigil, even Easter Sunday, do it once. It is so amazing to see that whole, that whole week. And it, it really is all connected. When you look one at the liturgy, one liturgy, it's all connected. So, for example, at the end of Holy Thursday, there's no final blessing. Instead, there's the procession. And then you go into Good Friday, and it starts without a sign of the cross. You know, so and we'll talk about how all these all, all these liturgies as they go along. But it, it's it really is one to the next to the next. And it just flows. It's pretty, pretty incredible. Um. So let's let's you know start. Of course, you know the first part of the week is pretty normal, but the liturgy is already ramping up to Holy Thursday, because when you look at the readings, if you you know if you go look at the readings for uh, Monday, Tuesday, and Wednesday, it's starting the process of our Lord's Passion. It's already He's in Jerusalem, He's getting ready. We have um, is it Wednesday is Spy Wednesday? I think they call it where. Uh, the reading is about Judas going and betraying our Lord for the 40 pieces of silver. So it's, it's already ramping up. It's, it's pretty funny where Holy Week doesn't really let you breathe very much. It's, it's constantly go, go, go liturgically. Now, do you, do you get to daily mass much or? Uh, no, I, I don't, but I do do the readings. Uh, I've got them on my iPhone and uh, listen mm. to divine office on, on that. So I do keep sure. up with them. Yeah. Um and they they are amazing. Um, the other thing is is that I know that officially, you know, Holy Thursday, Good Friday, Saturday. Yep. But I know it in our parish we also do some things earlier in the week. We do a, right. a tenebrae service. All oh, right. And uh, it's I think traditionally it should have been done on Thursday, Friday, or Saturday uh, as well. But we, we've traditionally done it in our parish on Tuesday, mm -hmm. and getting ready for for the, the Triduum. And it's, right. it's been a very beautiful ceremony. Right. Yeah. T Tenebrae is, is kind of a, it's a midnight service is really what it's meant to be. No, no, most parishes probably do it in, you know, late evening or something like that. Right. Yeah. But ours is like usually eight or nine o'clock at night. But it's um, the idea, you know, it's, it's, it's the liturgy hours. It, it's the, the breviary, but it's done in a way, um, that's much more symbolic. You know, for example, uh, in, during Tenebrae, there'll be these candles that are extinguished one at a time as it goes yes. along. So by the time you get to the end, there's no, the candles are out. It's completely dark, or at least that's the, the ideal. I'm sure most parishes don't do that anymore where they com completely turn off all the lights and everything, but we still, do. yeah. Oh, you do. Yes. So it does yeah. get completely, that's pretty cool. And yeah. at the very last one, they extinguish the main candle into the, I think it's into holy water. I'm not sure. Or if it's into sand, but at any rate, they, right. it's a very large part of it is at the end, you know, they do that. And then they have that really loud, clamorous noise. Right. And there's a word for that, but I can't remember it offhand, but where it's a, kind of a shocking yeah. contrast to the silence afterwards. Exactly. Exactly. You know, and unfortunately it's something that really, um, dropped off. You know, you 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 don't see it. it. It's not a part of the what we call the ordinary form now, the Nor Novus Ordo, whatever you want to call it. You know, the current rite of the Mass. It's something that very much came though from all the way back into the Middle Ages and, right. and earlier, and just kind of has disappeared. But but more and more parishes are starting to restore this tradition, and I think it's a beautiful idea. Again, it's it's. It's it's reflecting, you know, this this darkness of of the grave, this darkness of the tomb that our Lord, you know, Lord went through in his passion and death um, that gradual the light you know, disappears. But then on Easter, it comes back, 
you know, with with you know with the Easter fire and everything. So it's it's pretty, it's it's an impressive, uh, impressive idea. You know, I right. wish I, I'd like to do it someday. I, of course, you know, it, it it's one of those things I'd have to see it first probably before I tried to do it myself. You know, I've never been to one, unfortunately. We'll fly on down here next year. <laughs> there we go. Come down on Tuesday and and, and join it, and they have to hurry up and get back here on. Right. <laughs> Yeah. yeah, we do things like uh, Lamentations as far mm-hmm. as the music, and it's very, very moving. It's music you don't get to hear a lot of. And, right. Uh, yeah, that's that's awesome. Yeah, that's so. Yeah, you're, you're right, though. I mean, tradi- like you said earlier, it was traditionally done on like Thursday or Friday right. of Holy Week. So Holy Thursday, Good Friday. But I think it's it's worth moving it to another day, too, if nothing else, just because of schedules and everything. You know, well, and it kind of gives the people one more thing to be looking forward to and participating in exactly. during that week instead of just saying, oh, here's Thursday. <laughs> yep. All of a sudden, everything's crammed in. Yeah, exactly. But uh, but let's move ahead to to Holy Thursday, you know, because like I said, the first part of the week, there's not a lot going on, but it's kind of ramping up. But Holy Thursday is when things get going. Um, One thing you don't see on Holy Thursday very much anymore, just because of how diocese have changed the focus of it is the chrism mass i was gonna say that in our parish that's done in on tuesday also in the morning and it's a very very large thing with all of the the priests uh in the diocese participating yeah traditionally chrism mass is done on holy thursday morning and it's still written that way you look in the the roman missal it still talks about it being on holy thursday morning right but uh, a lot of dioceses have moved it to earlier in the week and then you get dioceses like mine, where we're the fourth largest by land, not by population. We're not even close by population, but by land. So, you know, we're, we're, we're almost as big. Our, my diocese is almost as big as the entire state of Wyoming. Wow. And that's the only reason why we're not the third largest, because Wyoming is one diocese. Oh, <laughs> my goodness. <laughs> but um, so we do ours earlier. We actually did ours a couple of weeks ago, because, of hmm. course, we need to be able to travel there. And come right. back, you know, for many of our, many of our priests, it's ours to get to the chrism mass. So to be able to get there on Holy Thursday morning, get the, the chrism and then come back, get the oils and then come back would be too difficult. And even for a more urban diocese like you're in, it's probably still a, a bit of a difficulty for many of the priests who might well, be a more outlier you know, right. Parishes. Our outlying parishes. Uh, we've got a fairly large geographical area, nothing like right. yours. But yeah, we have, uh, of course, Austin is the biggest city there, but we have a lot of outlying territories. So, yeah. yeah. But if you're if your diocese hasn't done the chrism mass yet, uh, I highly recommend going. Of course, by the time this gets released in, in many dioceses, they'll probably already have done it or will be doing it as it's being released. You know, kind of like again, like yours, where, you know, release on Tuesday. Um, they're already doing it or have already done it. So, but if you can get to it, it's worth it. it it's a beautiful mass. Um, the priests renew their promises to the bishop, which is, you know, always a very powerful moment for me as a priest, you know. Um, and then the the holy oils are blessed. And then, of course, after the mass, they're generally after the mass distributed to the, the parishes and so that they will be available for uh, the Easter vigil when they're first used again. So it's, it's a beautiful mass, you know, and I know, like, like you said, all the, most of the priests or all the priests gather together and a lot of people do as well. It's usually, you know, a great, great celebration. It's very much worth, worth attending if you can. And then things get quiet in the church after the chrism mass though. You know, again, if it's done on Thursday, because the next mass, by the way, no parish is allowed to have daily mass on Holy Thursday. You can't just have your normal morning daily mass. It's not allowed. Because in the evening, and usually 7 o'clock has kind of been my experience when a lot of parishes will do uh, Holy Thursday Mass. It's kind of become the traditional time for it. Where it's a little bit later in the evening, it's not quite supper time, but it's not dark usually either. You know, but, but then we get to Holy Thursday Mass. And it's... It's pretty incredible, isn't it? The Holy Thursday Mass. It is very emotionally and literally, uh, symbolically, uh, very, very meaningful. 
Oh, absolutely. There, there's so much, so much depth and meaning to it, because of course we're we're celebrating what is one of the key moments in our faith, and that is the the institution of the Eucharist. That moment when our Lord sat down with his apostles for the last time for supper before his death and gave us his body and blood in the Eucharist for the first time. And we remember that and we mark that with this this beautiful celebration, this beautiful mass, which also also has an image of service by the priest. Which is optional, and and admittedly, I haven't done it in a while, but the washing of the feet is also traditionally, or at least more commonly celebrated during the uh, Holy Thursday Mass. It's actually more more recent tradition, say last hundred years or so, that it's become a part of the Mass itself. But it's that beautiful symbolism, again, of the priest kneeling down or sitting down in front of his parishioners and literally washing their feet. You know, pouring water over them and drying them. Um, it's, it, and it's a beautiful symbol. Uh, it really did, is. I remember when my, I guess it was right after Vatican II, mm-hmm. that my mom was one of the parishioners who was asked to participate in the washing okay. of the feet. And that was such an emotionally wrenching thing for her. As sure. a convert, she had never participated in anything like that. And so for her, she felt she was just humbled by it, you know, that that she would be asked to do that. And so that's my first memory of that was my mom being asked in our parish uh, back in Arizona. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, it's it's it really is. It's a humbling moment for the priest, but it's supposed to be, you know, for me as a priest as well. It really it really is because it is supposed to be a symbol of service. I think part of the problem we run into, at least in shall we say, North American cultures, like, say, you know, United States, a lot of people don't feel comfortable with it. And so, especially in smaller parishes, it's really hard to convince people to do it. Right, right. You know, if the priest is willing to do it, it's hard to convince people to come forward. That's the first step. Yes, you have to get out of your pews and come forward to the front of the church. Take off your shoes and socks. Allow the priest to wash your feet. And I mean, immediately, a lot of times, again, it's more the symbolic of just washing one foot and pouring a little bit of water over one foot. But it's still hard to convince people to do it sometimes. <laughs> now, what is in in the I guess in the the rubrics or the liturgy uh, is was it intended to be a representative sample or was it intended to be for the whole parish? Because I know I like the representatives 12 or 20 or whatever. I don't feel very comfortable as a parishioner, even after all this time going up myself. Exactly. Um, It is just curious. I mean, well, originally it was um, just select men is how it was phrased. Um, Pope Francis a couple of years ago did change the, the rubrics just to say anyone, you know, select people. Right. So it really doesn't say specifically like uh, it should be representatives of different councils or groups or anything like that. It, it, it's it's left open. Yeah, it's it's left very much open to the discretion of the priest. And I've seen priests who. It doesn't even say like 12. It doesn't even say like a number. I mean, obviously, the symbolism is the priest representing Christ, washing the people repre- being, you know, who are there in the position of the the disciples, the apostles. But the liturgy really doesn't specify that. So it's, it's up to the discretion of the, the priest who's celebrating. You know, and I, I've, I've done it, again, it, when I did do it more frequently, uh, I've done it where I might have just had six people, because that's all I could scare up, basically. <laughs> yeah. You know, um, again, now with, with both men and women, uh, being able to to be chosen, you know, at least with it within the rubrics, I think it might be a little bit easier. But again, you know, it, it's up to the priest if he wants to do, say, you know, so many men, so many women, you know, certain men from different groups or certain, you know, ages, and you know, this really gets into the discretion of the priest. 
And again, it really does come down to, especially if you're in a smaller parish, who's willing to do it? Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know, it would be nice to say, yes, I'm going to have so many older people and so many younger people, so many men, so many women, so many people from this council, so many people from that council. But then when you're out there and you're going, would anybody like to do this? Cricket, 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 you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, but, it, but again, it is a, it is a beautiful symbol. Um, and it, it really is a, a reminder for the priest, if nothing else, but also for the pop, for the congregation that the priest is there to serve. Now that service isn't, we're there to do what you want. That right. the, the priest service is a service leader, leadership service. We serve by being leaders, but we're still serving. You know, we are not there. A priest isn't there to do his own thing just because he thinks he needs to do it because he's the priest. And frankly, there's some priests who need to be reminded of that. <laughs> yes, yes, unfortunately. You know, unfor- you know we're, we're human too, and we, we have our, our egos, but it is still a service. And it's, it's, it's an honor for me as a priest to be able to serve as a priest. And that, that's, I think that's part of what it, it shows us. Uh, is that honor of service. But then following that, again, we switch into the, the, the mass, which is pretty normal at this point. You know, there really hasn't been a lot of additions to the mass yet, you know, other than the washing of the feet after the homily. Um, but it takes on a little different focus going forward because, of course, the focus is on that Last Supper. And so, you know, we, we, we celebrate the, the, the Eucharistic prayer is normal and everything is normal until after communion. And then it gets a little different. This is where it starts switching up. Um, the Eucharist isn't just put in the tabernacle and we close off the Mass. We have a procession. You know, because one thing that should have happened is a special altar of repro- repose was set up. And a lot of parishes, I don't know if your parish does this, but a lot of parishes, they really decorate it beautifully. Yes. You know? Yes, it's a, it's a separate chapel, and mm-hmm. it's very much like the old monastic chapels. And mm-hmm. so uh, the procession goes in there, and we're, of course, the Pange Lingua is what yep. normally is sung during that procession until we get up to uh, the enshrinement, you know, and, he, and the priest puts the, the monstrance up on the, the or the, um, not the monstrance, or is I'm trying to Saborium, remember. the Saborium. Right, Saborium. Anyway, when he puts it up on the front, then we switch into usually another uh, yeah. Duraflay or some beautiful uh, hymn with its right. uh, testament to the, uh, the Eucharist. Yeah. And then people will come and visit until late hours. Yep. In yeah, adoration. It, yeah, uh, what's kind of the way the rubric's written, and it's probably what you do, you the Duraflay, you do the Tantamergo. Yes, yes, right. You know, and... Uh, which, of course, the Pange Lingua, if, you know, the way Thomas Aquinas, this is one of the hymns Thomas Aquinas wrote, goes from the Pange Lingua to the Tantum Ergo. Tantum Ergo right, is like the last two verses. I like that idea, though, of going to, instead of just the, the traditional chant, you know, Pange Lingua Gloriosa, da, 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 you know, instead of going from that, you go to a different setting of the Tantum Ergo to right. make that emphasis that, you know, this is... You know, this is something special and beautiful that we have here. And, uh, you know, of course, unfortunately, again, you know, small parish, I, I'm usually the one leading the music. So, right. you know, so I'm, I'm chanting it as best I can as I'm carrying the the, month, the Saborium and everything. Uh, not not the best, the uh, best example, admittedly, but, it, it you know, it works pretty well. But, um. Yeah, but then it switches over to the Tanto Marigo and the and the Saborium is placed in the, the, the tabernacle, the altar of repose. And then yeah, people can come and pray. And I think a lot of places traditionally to the uh up to um midnight or so. Yeah, that's what we know. do is up to midnight. You know, and then and then things get quiet. The altar is stripped. The altar's bare, the tabernacle's empty. You know, if you of course you know, many parishes where the tabernacle's in the church there, it's very striking to see the altar cleared and the tabernacle the light is blown out and the yeah the doors wide open of the tabernacle and it's just like this is interesting and the the interesting to see too is people are so used to genuflecting before the tabernacle and then right. it's like oh wait he's not there 
Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Yeah. We, we, when we enter the church, of course, we're used to genuflecting as we come in. Of course, we're genuflecting to our Lord in the tabernacle. Well, when the tabernacle's empty, we bow to the altar. Right. You know, and, and, and I, I've had to catch myself where I'll be walking across the church and I'll cross in front of the altar and I'll start to genuflect. Oh, yeah. Wow. <laughs> Not today. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. And then uh, did we talk about the statues uh, and the uh, images being covered? Did you cover that on last week's? We did. We did talk about that a little bit uh, about how for like the last two weeks, what we commonly call Passion Tide, the the images are veiled. Right. As a child, that was very striking to me to see all of the shrouds. Is yep. I would think of them uh, as shrouds over the statues and, and that's the, really the what paintings. They are. That's really what they are. It's pretty incredible. Yeah, it's 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 another one of those traditional practices that kind of disappeared following the Second Vatican Council. Not because of the council, but just kind of because of the liturgical movements at the time that's starting to come back again. Yeah, the people are starting to rediscover this and rediscover the the beauty and the power of it. So it, it's pretty incredible. And yeah, the, the, the images are all covered still at this point. Well, what made me think of it is that the, what I was reading up on it before today, I guess I had thought that the cross was covered too. And right. they said liturgically that the cross would be uncovered, that the processional cross yep. would be uncovered while this was going on. And I was thinking they were all covered, but. Right. Uh, well, there's, and there's, uh, when we get into Good Friday here in just a minute, that the uncovering of the cross is also a part yes. of the ceremony. But yeah, you're right though. The processional cross, I do believe is traditionally left uncovered for Holy Thursday, you know, but that's the only one, you know, all the other ones are traditionally, including right. the main crucifix is usually covered or traditionally covered. Anyways, like I said, some, par- some parishes do it and some parishes don't, but it's starting to become more and more common. But, uh, so let, yeah, let's, let's kind of make that shift now into Good Friday. So the, all, the church is empty, basically, at this point. You know, the, 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 the Blessed Sacrament uh, is reposed in the, the altar, the altar of repose. Um, the main tabernacle is open. The altar is stripped. And there's nothing. There's not even candles on the altar. There's to be nothing. It's just a bare altar. Um, now, traditionally, again, we talk a lot of these traditionally because there's a lot of this stuff that some of it's explicit in the rubrics. Some of it is just kind of traditional practice. Um, the traditional practice for Good Friday is that three o'clock is the moment when our Lord died. And so traditionally, the Good Friday service is at 3 p.m. To, again, to commemorate that. And I've always loved the Good Friday service. First of all, it's not a mass. At all. Right. Uh, a, a term you might hear for it is the mass of the pre-sanctified. But I it's, hadn't heard that. Yeah, that's interesting. That, that's uh, the, um, the Eastern churches uh, keep that term a lot more. They'll call it the liturgy of the pre-sanctified. Uh, the Western church used to use it a lot more than we do now. But it, it's, a, it, it's, it's such an incredible thing because... This is the one day, at least in the, the Western church, that mass is not celebrated at all. It's this liturgy, this, this service, and uh, it starts in silence. It starts no entrance hymn. Instead, the priest, priest and deacon, profet, process in and prostrate themselves before the altar. Again, in silence, the priest lays down and sits there for silent for a silent period, and then gets up and starts again without the sign of the cross. Just immediately, let us pray. Are the first words the priest says, and it's a again as a priest, it's a powerful moment to come in and everybody's standing there for the procession, and then I lay down. And I, I was kind of wonder what, what parishioners think when they see that, if, especially if they don't have the experience of the liturgy as much. You know, what, what's your experience of that? Oh, it's very moving. And to me, when that happens, 
I immediately think of the ordination mass mm -hmm. because that's at one point the priests yep. lay flat on the floor. And yep. to me, that's that kind of echoes back and forth, you know, that the uh, I was a once a priest, a priest forever. And yep. on Good Friday that you are entering fully into that. Mm -hmm. And it's it's pretty awesome. Oh, it is. It sometimes goes on for more than people are comfortable with. And I think that's good. Yes. The fact yeah. that it makes people a little anxious. When is he going to get up? When is he going to get yeah. up? It's that yeah. tension. Yeah, exactly. You know, and it's it's that's almost kind of the ideal is that the priest doesn't just go there, lay down for five, ten seconds and then get up. But right. that he's there for a good minute or more where there is just silence in the church and people are kind of maybe looking at him going, uh, did he fall asleep? <laughs> <laughs> like in the garden. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But it, it, it's, it should be uncomfortable. I mean, it should be uncomfortable to see your priest laying there. It should be uncomfortable that silence because we know it's the silence of our Lord's passion. It's the silence of death. And that's what it's about. It's a reminder for us that what we are doing is about this moment where our Lord gave his life for us. So it, it's, again, it's a very powerful, moving moment in liturgy. It's arguably one of the most moving moments for me personally as a priest of the I year. I see that, yeah. Um, but then we go right into the readings. We have the opening prayer right into the readings. And the passion, we, we proclaim the passion again. And we did on Palm Sunday, passion. Palm Sunday of the Lord's Passion, the, the technical title. We, those we do from Matthew, Mark, or Luke. This one is the Gospel of John, always. And it's, again, we have that, that beautiful proclamation of the passion where, you know, there's the different voices and, and we, 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 Mark our Lord by, you know, I love that it, all the passions do this, but I love that moment where, you know, he bows his head and dies and everybody has turns and, and kneels at that moment. And I always make, sure, make it a, a point to kneel to the crucifix, you know, to turn to the crucifix and kneel down. And again, another moment of silence, that uncomfortable silence of remembering what, hap what just happened. You know, it's, and then, yeah, it's, it's just, again, another one of those, no, another just powerful, powerful moments in the liturgy. Exquisitely so. Yeah. Oh, yes. Very much so. And I have to admit, as a kid, um, anything like the passion, I always hated because it took forever. Now, as a yeah. priest, I'm like, this is now, now I get it. Now I understand it. Yes, it's it was long. long for him too. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Jesus went. Jesus went for what six hours? I think was the length of his. When you go from from the trial to his crucifixion, was something like six hours, right? And that's what we proclaim in course of ten, fifteen minutes that we're just standing there. Uh, but it is a beautiful, uh, be again, another beautiful moment of the liturgy. Uh, Following the, the homily uh, is, the other, is another. I mean, this, this whole liturgy is just full of beautiful. I'm sitting there going, okay, that's beautiful, and that's beautiful, and that's beautiful. Because it is. The whole liturgy is beautiful. I should just say that. But there but, are uh, moments. <laughs> yeah, but there are specific moments. And we have that, the veneration of the cross following the, the homily, uh, which hopefully the priest is going to be short, as I usually am. But hopefully the priest is going to be short for his homily, because... <laughs> Right. Yeah, you know, we just stood for the passion. It, it, it. Let's keep it short and move on. But uh, that's that's another one of those powerful moments where we come up and we venerate the cross, and we kind of touched on it briefly. But when the cross is processed in, a lot of times the cross will be covered again with like a purple yes. cloth, just like all the other images are, and the priest will slowly uncover it as he, you know, this is the wood of the cross on which hung the Savior of the world. Come, let us worship. Three as times. He, three times as he processes in. And I usually do the first at the door, you know, like we'll have the cross at the entranceway of the church. First at the front, the door to the church or to the, the nave, middle 
and then right up by the altar. Right. And then give the hand the cross off to the server so everybody can venerate the the cross after after I do. Um I usually help out to hold it too. I you know I know some priests will just let the servers handle it, but I use it, it's something I like to do as well is to to help hold the you cross. You like to help carry the cross. <laughs> carry the cross and present the cross to the people. Right. Um Yeah. So and and it's it is I mean Obviously, you know, that's, I think, a moment people really look forward to. And I don't know what your your experience of that is, but I think a lot of people really look forward to that moment. Yes. And depending upon what year and which priest we had, sometimes it would be one cross. Sometimes there would be multiple crosses because right. there, it's a large parish. Right. But I think he's basically come back to the one main cross now again, yep. as opposed to multiples. And that makes more significance. It's just takes a lot longer time. Right. Well, and then people, when they come up, some will kneel and mm -hmm. kiss the foot. Others will just touch the wood of the cross and, yep. or, and or kiss the cross. And yep. others will just put their hand on there and bow for a few minutes. And it's yep. really interesting to see the different traditional backgrounds of the people coming forward and how they express that. Exactly. And the Hispanics tend to be a lot more emotional with it. Mm -hmm. And uh, because that's their faith tends to yep. be much more um, evocative. Yeah. And so it's 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 interesting. And seeing the little babies come up in their parents' arms and they touch it, you know. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It, it's, it's, a, it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful ceremony, beautiful uh, uh, ritual, if you will. Um, and I, I think one point that needs to be made is. And this is, you know, as much speaking to my brother priests, we shouldn't rush it. We shouldn't rush these liturgies. Yes, I, I made the comment about the homily, but we shouldn't rush these liturgies. If they take longer, if it takes 15 minutes to do the veneration of the cross because you only have one cross and you've got a thousand people there, so be it. Right. So be it. Let it take time. Let it soak in. Exactly. <laughs> to the people. Exactly. Yeah. And the, and the the rubrics do allow that if pastoral needs, you can have more than one cross. But my question, unless you're talking about tens of thousands of people, why? I mean, really, why? We're, we're not, we're in such a rush, rush, go, go culture. Why not slow down? Why not take the time to do it right? And if that means there are people that can't stay for the whole thing, so be it. Well, and usually at three o'clock, that means you've taken off of work yep. and you have no place to, else to be until mm -hmm. supper time. Or exactly. if you go in the evening, again, this is typically people after right. work. Yep. So again, why rush it? Now, if you have families where there might be some situations you need to get back to family, that's understandable. But right. yeah, I agree. It really should be give it the reverence it mm -hmm. deserves. You know, it's. I mean, every every parish is different. Every situation is a little bit different. But I would argue, uh, by and large, let it take its time. Let it take as long as it needs. You know, it, this is, yeah, you know, this is again. This is the this is the high point, or we're entering into the high point of our liturgical celebration for the year. Right. We haven't quite gotten to the climax yet. We're almost there. This is one of the most important moments. Let's have it take its time. Right. You know? So, yeah, anyway, so that, that's my little, my little rant, if you will, about, about liturgy, is, is especially at this moment. We, we don't need to be out of there in 30 minutes, 45 minutes. If it takes over an hour, let it take over an hour. Right. Um, Sundays, you can well, worry about that more. <laughs> Yeah, and in our parish, we'd usually have two, one at three o'clock mm. and then another one in the evening. And usually sure. it's like the Hispanics uh, have a more extended via way of the cross, you know, sure. uh, that they've been doing during Lent. And then this is kind of the culmination of that for them. But uh, it just depends upon, you know, usually there's there's two different times that we could right. go. Right. So we well, very that, yeah, and of course, you know, the Stations of the Cross, of course, that's another traditional practice you'll see on Good Friday. Um, oh, yes. Lots of time, you know, like we'll still, we've been doing it every week, you know, Friday evening, um, and I think we'll, we'll continue it again uh, for Good Friday. 
but it, it's just it's we reflect on on the cross and we we venerate the cross because we know it is through the cross our salvation has come that's why we do this so it's it's again it's very beautiful and then it almost seems anticlimactic to me as a priest what you know the the fact that communion follows right after the veneration of the cross and it's it's almost just like okay now we've done that let's get this done and we'll go on because we venerate the cross and then it's right into communion and it's the communion rite so it's everything that's after the um after the the eucharistic prayer so we have the our father we have the you know behold the lamb of god and we go right into communion it's just real quick it, it's it's like i said it seems almost anticlimactic and i think that's on purpose i think that's almost kind of okay I mean, this is receiving our Lord is always important in the Eucharist, but we've done, we've venerated our Lord's cross. Now we go forward and wait for him to return. You know, it's just that, that kind of like, that was the focus for this liturgy was the, the veneration of the cross, but it's still important. We re receive our Lord's body, blood, soul, and divinity. In the I was curious Eucharist. about that because as a lay person looking at it, it would almost seem like you would have Holy Thursday. Good Friday with the veneration, and then because that he has died, that we would not receive him again until the 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 vigil. And I was curious. I mean, it does seem to me like kind of a it just placed in there. But is that intentionally? I, it I, is I, supposed to be there. I, well, it, it is supposed to be there because, of course, I mean, we should always seek to receive our Lord every chance we can, every day we can. Um, and in a way, we could say that by by re receiving. Again, it, we don't consecrate the Eucharist that day. That's true. That's true. You know, so we're receiving, I hate to use this word because it almost sounds insulting, but the leftovers from Holy Thursday. Right. You know, the, the host that we receive, the, the, the Eucharist that we receive on Good Friday were, were consecrated the night before and then placed in the altar of repose. Um, we're still uniting ourselves to our Lord. Um, and receiving his body. If, if anything, though, it is saying, you know, that is the moment of sacrifice. And now we are uniting ourselves to that sacrifice by receiving him. Because, okay. of course, you look back at the old, uh, the old Testament, the old covenant. The priests would receive from the sacrifices that they made. There were things that were sacrificed that the priests would receive a portion of it. Right. You know, so um, there's still kind of that connection. You know, and, and admittedly, off the top of my head, I don't know all the theology behind the fact that we have uh, the reception of our Lord, uh, the, the Eucharist, following the veneration of the cross. But I, I do know, again, it's, it's part of that joining in the sacrifice that we just remembered and celebrated with the, the passion and the veneration of the cross. Um, and then we leave in silence again. You know, it, it's, it, there's always that. And I always try to make it a point of announcing that. It's like, okay, you know, as, as, as you leave the church, I encourage you to, to leave in silence. You know, if you wish to visit, please wait till you're outside. Right. You know, because we should have that silence as we leave the church, that, that mourning, really, we're mourning of the fact that our Lord had to die for our sins. You know. And then things get quiet again in the church. You know, a um, lot of lot of places, the, uh, the they won't put if there's any hosts left over, they won't put them in the altar of repose. They'll just put them back in the tabernacle at that moment. And the liturgy allows for that. But it's quiet again. Um, and we're going to move on to unless you got more you want to say about Good Friday. No, I think that pretty much covers both, most of my thoughts on that. Yeah, yeah it's, it's like I said, it's powerful, powerful ceremony. But before we go on to Easter. I'm going to take a break. We need to take a break and, and thank, thank people for listening to Let's Talk. Uh, you know, of course, we're always grateful that you join us every week for this podcast and all the other SQPN community podcasts, such as Secrets of Technology that Pat and I are both on, or uh, Secrets of Doctor Who and Secrets of Star Trek that I'm on with Jimmy and Dom, Jimmy's Aiken's Mysterious World, and all the other uh, podcasts. I hope you, you do enjoy them. I hope you're sharing them. Please do share our podcast. We want people to listen to them. We want people to join us, to share them, to like them on Facebook, to uh, subscribe to our 
YouTube channel where you can listen to them through YouTube. Um, of course, podcast apps such as Google Podcast, iTunes, and so on, where you can find them. Please leave reviews, leave uh, ratings on iTunes. The higher, the better. You know, of course, the more, the higher your, your rating, the more will show up on iTunes. And of course, we greatly appreciate that. Uh, we also appreciate those who who help keep SQPN going with their uh, support through Patreon. Patreon is a great way that you can uh, we monthly support our shows, and you can choose which shows you want to support uh, directly as you do do this every week. And as we've been doing, I'd like to thank some of our, our patrons, Patreon patrons, uh, my neighbor to the north, Father Daryl, Matt M., AJ, Jenny N., and Thomas Z. Thank you all and all of our Patreon patrons for your support. You know, it helps keep the lights on figuratively as far as keeping the website up and everything. And literally in Dom's case, because he is, our, you know, as our CEO, he is paid by SQPN to do his work. And he I know he appreciates being able to feed his family uh, and keep uh, keep your keep your grandchildren fed. That's always a good <laughs> <Yes>. thing, right? <laughs> uh, but uh, we, we, we do thank you for your support, and it, it's greatly appreciated. If you would like to join our Patreon campaign, you can go to sqpn.com slash give. And we do, again, greatly appreciate everyone who supports us that way. All right. We've gone through Holy Thursday. We've gone through Good Friday. Now everything's quiet. Holy Saturday, the morning, nothing is going on. The church is quiet. Now, symbolically, the church is quiet. In actuality, there's usually a lot of stuff going on Holy, Holy Saturday in, in most parishes, aren't there? Yes, putting a last-minute rehearsal usually, mm -hmm. and uh, also the getting of all the flowers ready to be put out. Yep. And, uh, and uh, all the Easter lilies uh, crowding the, the, the choir staircases we try to go up and practice. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there's, yeah, there's, there's decorating the church. There's uh, getting, you know, again, choir is doing their last minute practice. Liter the, the priests are going through and maybe they're working with like altar servers and lectors and everybody to know what's going on. And there's kind of the last minute stuff is happening. You know, but again, the, the church is quite, hopefully, you know, hopefully your parish is offering confessions, which by the way, uh, I would highly recommend sometime during Holy Week to seek that out. Uh, if you have the opportunity to seek out the sacrament of confession. Um, and then the evening comes and we start out with a fire. And hopefully most parishes can actually do an actual fire, not just a, a little charcoal or something like that. Uh, when I was in the Air Force, I did four years active duty. I spent one Easter over in Saudi Arabia, and we were not allowed an open fire. So they uh. took a little a little piece of charcoal with a with some like or like yeah, I was thinking it was like a little piece of charcoal with like a little bit of wood shavings or something like that, and that was our Easter fire. Oh, it was just like oh, it works, I guess. It's a fire, but it's not the same. So. I always try to have a nice little, not really a bonfire, but I get, you know, like one of those nice fire pits right. and have it out here in our courtyard and we'll have a nice fire going, you know, it won't be a big blazing, you know, 55 gallon drum full of fire, but it'll be a nice little, nice little, you know, campfire there to start out with. What What is your... Your parish usually. Yeah, do. we usually try to do that unless it's bad weather. Mm -hmm. But one of the things that the, the parish does is the uh, scouts help with the fire. Oh, they there you are go. the ones who are the, uh, they know how to do it safely. That's and they thing. are a part of the parish. And then <laughs> the choir mixes in with the congregation out in the courtyard. Oh, sure. And uh, usually we try to, it, it's usually dark or right. getting dark at that point. So yep. it's very much more dramatic. Yeah. And uh, yeah, beautiful. Yeah, yeah it, it's supposed to be, actually, when you read the rubrics, it's supposed to be completely dark. You know, but I think most people, as long as it's after sunset and then after, as long as it's twilight, shall we say, you know, it, it's, it's obviously, it's dark. It's not right after sunset. It's not, you know, if, if it's a point where you have to turn on your headlights to get to mass, that's usually kind of about the point that most, uh, most parishes will have their Easter vigil. 
Yeah, that typically ours are, are uh, as soon as father says it's been long enough after sunset and it's yeah. and it's pretty dark out there. Yeah, generally about a half an hour after sunset is what I try to do. So like the, the sun is uh, supposed to set about, I want to say 8 o'clock, 8, 10 in the evening. So it's about, it's 8.30 is what I have mine scheduled for. So it should right. be should be fairly dark by that point, but it's not, again, not so dark that it's completely black, although that's kind of what it should be. But here in Montana this time of year, you're talking nine o'clock or later by the time it's yeah. that dark, you know, yeah. the days are finally getting long enough where it's kind of, it stays light for quite a while, which is a good thing. We're happy about that, by the way. Um, but yeah, we start with the fire and you have the Easter candle and they do the, the, the incense, the little grains of incense that the priest pokes in there and he draws on it and they light the candle and everybody else has candles and it's, it's really impressive. And um, there's a moment after we're done out in the courtyard as and we, oh, by the way, we process in, you know, singing and everything. And there's a moment that I, I love. So the priest comes in, comes to the door of the church, you know, Christ our light, thanks be to God. Entrance to the, the nave, Christ our light, thanks be to God. Standing by the altar once everybody's in, Christ our light, thanks be to God. And there's a moment that only the priest and servers get to see. And I love this moment. You walk into the darkened church. The church is dark. I mean, it's supposed to be like, if you can turn out every light, you can. Yes. Generally, the only lights I've, at least in the churches I've, I've served in, the only lights are the exit lights, you know, because of course you have to have those on, you know, fire code and all that. And as the church, the priest is standing up by the altar holding the Paschal candle. People are coming in with their lit candles and it's getting lighter and lighter and lighter to the point where the church, by the time everybody's in there, the church is completely lit just by the candles, not even by the light, you know, the, the, the electric lights on the ceiling. And it is so cool to see just how it gets bright, like the dawn. I mean, it really right. looks like that. And that's what it's supposed to do. That's what it's supposed to look like. The dawn awakening, you know, the, dawn, the lightning of the sky as the dawn comes. It's such a beautiful moment. It really is powerful. Again, another very powerful moment in these liturgies of seeing the church just get brightened. We, the choir usually slips in right ahead or right. As soon as the priest walks into the church, the choir right. slips in and goes upstairs. And so we see the trickling candles as they're going up the aisle. And getting, oh, yes. And it, it, it is just, it's so moving. It really is. It is. And it just really makes your heart go. <laughs> yeah. But we are, we are celebrating at that moment that the light of Christ has come back into the world because he is raised from the dead in the middle of the night. No one saw it. He came out of the tomb and he's alive. And in glory. In, yeah. yeah, in glory. And that's the that light filling the church from the candles is the symbol is symbolizing that glory of God filling the world once again with with Christ being raised from the dead. And it, it is so. So beautiful, so powerful. And then we have that, that great moment. Now, does your, does your priest proclaim the exalted or does the choir sing it or? Uh, usually it's one single person. Uh, okay. Sometimes it's been our choir director, depending upon how mm -hmm. bad father's voice is at the moment uh, or how good the, 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 the choir director's voice is. So from year to year, it may be one or the other. Traditionally, I think most of the time it's our pastor that does it, but there okay. have been a couple of times where he had voice problems. <laughs> uh oh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that whole week. <laughs> yeah. Oh, that that's, I, I always try to proclaim it and I love it. And it's actually kind of funny because when I was ordained a priest, it was still in the original 1970 translation. And at seminary, our, choir, our, our music director helped us learn it and all but almost memorize it, you know. And right. it's a long prayer. It's a beautiful prayer, and I love chanting it. So then the new translation comes out, and I had to completely relearn it. Yeah. Because the music <laughs> is similar, very, very a similar chant. But, of course, it is different. But I love that, you know, it just, 
it starts out, exult, let them exult, the hosts of heaven. Exult, let angel, angel ministers of God exult. Let the trumpet of salvation sound aloud our mighty king's triumph. That symbolism of the trumpet. Because it... Yeah. Exult, let them exult, the hosts of heaven. Just right into it. It's just, it's like a trumpet blasting. Mm-hmm. You know, just the phrasing and everything. It's, it's so beautiful. You know, the, the symbolism of the light, you know, the light glory floods, her. let earth be glad as glory floods her. I, I could just read through the whole exalted. I actually just pulled it up <laughs> off the USCCB website. It is so beautiful. But there's this, the symbolism of, you know, the, the, the pillar of, you know, the pillar of fire that led uh, the Israelites out of Egypt is symbolized by the, the pillar of the candle. And there's even, you know, a prayer for the bees that made the wax wow. that made the candle. <laughs> it is just so cool. The, the, just the symbolism. If you get a chance again, all I searched for was exultant. Uh, go to the USCCB website and read the, the Easter proclamation, the exultant. It's so beautiful. Um, and, and amazing. And, and if you've got a priest who can sing as I, I, I Yes, I can say I can. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's great to see. And, and, you know, it can be recited. And I have done that in the past. Again, when, when the translation first came out, I recited it because I wasn't able to learn it well enough to be able to chant it well. Because it, it should be done right. But it, it's worth. It is so worth hearing. And it's just beautiful. Um, and then we start the readings. And there are a lot of readings. And again, an encouragement to my brother priests, don't rush the Easter vigil. Do all seven. Because the liturgy allows for the option of choosing four of the first readings. Or is it three of the first readings plus the um, epistle from Paul? I can't remember which off the top of my head. But um, don't rush it. Because these seven readings... They're the proclamation of salvation history. Yes. We watch the story of, pro- of salvation history build through those seven readings. And yeah, it's long because you have a reading, you have a psalm, responsorial psalm, you have a prayer. We stand up, there's a prayer. We sit down, reading two. We stand up, there's, you know. But don't, it's beautiful. It's, I always do all seven. I have never yes. cut it down. Because it is, it's worth it. It's worth taking the time to do it. People are going to come to Easter Vigil. They'll stay for, the, for it. You know? And yeah, it'll be late when you're done. And you'll be tired. But that's part of the experience. Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, we... Um, but it's just... It, again, it's just incredible for these reading after reading after reading. And you're just being immersed in the story of salvation. And then it gets interesting. And again, because it's the story of salvation, it really is a timeline of salvation. Because then after the seventh reading and after the prayer, we have the Gloria. We proclaim the glory to God again. We haven't, well, we did it at uh, Holy Thursday, but we haven't done that all Lent, except Holy Thursday. And then all of a sudden we're doing it again. Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace to people of goodwill. Breaks out. It's incredible. You know, now I, I assume your choir does a, a beautiful version then as well. Uh, yeah, but it's also one that the, the, the parish knows. Right. Uh, the, with our parish, I guess our, our choir director believes that the parish involvement is extremely important. And there are mm-hmm. places that we do things that they don't do. Right. But where we can, where it's appropriate, they should be involved. So it's not a very complicated one. Right. But uh, there are other hymns that we do or other uh, uh, things that we do it during in between the, mm-hmm. uh, the readings, for instance, right. sure. uh, that that would work out. Right. But the thing I always liked about the Gloria is usually we still have the ch- church in common semi-darkness mm-hmm. during a, a lot of that. And then the Gloria, all the lights come on. Oh, yeah. The big church bells up in the in the belfry go off. Oh, yeah. The organ, you know, starts its thing. And it's just, you know, because the organ's been quiet all in, yep. too. Yep. And it is just 
Oh, it's shattering. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah. The uh, the can the, that's that's one thing I forgot to mention is the altar. The only candle that is lit after the exultant is the Easter candle. Right. And then all the other candles are lit. The altar candles are lit. The bells are rung. Uh, both the like the communion bell and right. the, uh, the, the 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 consecration bell and the main bell. You know, so you know nine thirty, ten o'clock at night. You're ringing the, the big the bells, big bells. <laughs> you know, so I'll go and, you know, of course we have a little switch. It's kind of a, it's, it's not much fun to ring the, the main bell here. We only have one bell on our bell tower, but not much fun. You just tr- turn on a light switch, but it still works. We have, I think there's five bells in mm-hmm. our belfry and uh, either the servers or choir members will come down and traditionally ring them and they're pulling on that thing. Oh, yeah. And they're, you know, you can see them priming it and they always open the windows Oh, so so can that they them. can, the people can hear the big bells too. Oh yeah, and it's like their voices. Yeah, you know those b- bells are are singing, and I almost can put words to it. Oh yeah, absolutely, it, it is glorious. It yeah. really is. I mean, it, it's if it's done well, it's absolutely breathtaking. I mean, just again, that you know, the church lights up with the candles. You've got the bells and the singing, and it's just we're praising God because our Lord ro- rose from the dead. Yes. And it's just beautiful. And then we move, you know, and it's, I, I've seen it done before. And unfortunately, it's not the way the liturgy designs is designed. It's not supposed to be. You're actually supposed to turn on the, the church lights during the exalted. Although you said, you know, they do semi-darkness. So they must just turn on a couple of lights or. Yeah, just just enough kind of for the readers to uh, be able to see. Right. But the, but the, yeah, it's it's not very bright. You know, but um, I've seen it before where. The uh, all the readings were done in darkness, except for like a flashlight. So right, the, just a the little lecture light. And then as soon as um, as soon as the Gloria starts, all the lights are turned on. Yes, and that's that. I mean, that is such a, a I mean, amazing thing. It's not liturgical, but it is beautiful. <laughs> yes, <laughs> it's inspired. <laughs> yeah, I, I wish I wish it would be. I wish the liturgy would allow for that. I mean. Actually, you know, the rubrics would permit that explicitly because it is so cool to see. Um, but then we go, you know, we're going to kind of move ahead a little bit because we're kind of we're going to be a longer show tonight today, which is fine. I don't don't mind. That's a nice thing. We can take the time. Talk about just these like things. Easter. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> take, take the time. The time. <laughs> um, but then we have the the epistle from Paul and the the gospel. As I recall, unfortunately, I forgot to grab my little book, but as I recall, it's the gospel where they find the tomb empty. And uh, they don't know what happened. And it, it's just incredible. Again, that, that moment of the, the apostles don't know. The disciples don't know what happened. They don't know how our Lord rose from the dead. Um, after the homily, it's a lot of times, if a parish is doing RCIA, this is when people are baptized. This is when the, the new, new converts are baptized, when those who are, doesn't necessarily have to be done this way, but a lot of parishes too, they also do the candidates, or a catechu- yeah, candidates, those who are uh, already baptized who are coming into the church. A lot of times this is when they're brought into the church as well. The uh, confirmation of them. Yeah, the yes. confirmation and, and all that. And uh, again, just a beautiful moment, when, especially when you can have multiple when you can have a whole line of people up front getting ready to be baptized, that's so cool. <laughs> yeah, we have our baptistry at the back of the church. Okay. And so typically when that happens, and we've had 50 at a time sometimes. Wow. And uh, some some years it's only 20 or 30. but right. uh, Only. <laughs> usually the, it's, it's a, a large baptistry, kind sure. of a, you could walk into it right, type right. thing. And so the last couple of years when it's been so many people, We've had two priests okay. that are baptizing at the same time, typically one of them in Spanish, one of them in English, but not always. Right, right. And uh, so it's, it's again, that's a very long process. And most of the people try to come out and surround the, but there's mm. not room for everybody sure. back by, behind the ba- baptistry. But in the choir sings, after every set of baptisms, we sing, uh, you have put on Christ, in him mm-hmm. you, you have, have been baptized. Yep. And it's just glorious <laughs> yeah it really is it really is you know and, and 
few years ago, I had, again, you know, this is a small parish. We don't have a lot of people converting. I'd love to have more. Uh, but yes, we had a couple of families come in. So we had 10 people up front, you know, because we don't have a, wow. a baptistry. We just, we've got a little uh, a portable baptistry, if you will. Font. Uh, <laughs> yeah, portable font that, that I pull in from the altar whenever we have a baptism. And so we uh, had them all lined up up front and just went right down the line. Yep. And it was, again, it was, it's an incredible, incredible thing to see. It really is, is wonderful. Um. So it, it's so beautiful to see whole families that are coming oh, yes. into the church, you know, the infants all the way up to the mom and dad. Yeah. And uh, we do the, of course, the, the, you know, they, they're wearing a gray garment mm -hmm. until the time of the baptism. And then they go back after they've been baptized and put on the white garment. Sure. sure. And get the candle. So yeah. it's, it's, it's just beautiful. Yeah. I've, I've seen a lot of, a lot of parishes do that. We, we don't do any kind of special garbs, you know, usually just tell people to wear, you know, some white clothes, a white shirt or something like that. But, we don't right. do, we don't do the, the, the robes or anything like that, but I've seen a lot of parishes do that. Um, yeah, just a simple cloth, yep. gray tunic type thing. Oh, okay. That works. Yeah. And then, uh, then they, then they put on white, whatever they have chosen to, right. to purchase or whatever. A white know. dress or a white shirt or right. jacket yeah. or something like that. Yeah. Oh, that's great. Uh, that, that, again, it's yeah, that the beautiful symbolism of, you know, um, of that white, that being washed from our sins and their souls are pure at that moment that we see in the, the Baptist baptismal liturgy. Um, it is kind of, I will say again, kind of pulling back the veil of, of, you know, for celebration, it's a little bit confusing for a priest because with the new translation of the Roman Missal versus the old translation of the rite of Christian initiation, you're back and forth between the two books. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Yeah, there are yeah. certain things that are in the Roman Missal, like the entire baptis baptismal rite is not in the Roman Missal. There's some of it that's in the RCIA book, so you got to go back and forth. Certain things oh, are here. <laughs> so you put little sticky notes in the book saying, okay, now go to this page, you switch over, now go to this page. You know. <laughs> but it's good, though. I mean, it, it really, it's worth it. Like I said, all this is, is worth the, the stress and tiredness that comes from it you know yeah. um and then what's again this is almost anticlimactic but after we get through with the baptisms and the confirmations of course those who are coming into the church and those who are newly baptized if they're seven years or older are confirmed right. at that moment and then it's just kind of a normal mass the you know the the the, the right of the eucharist is pretty much normal at that point you know that we have the consecration and of course you have people receiving their first communion and everything but it just kind of goes back to normal and we have finally our final blessing and we're sent on our way to celebrate easter i mean it's it's, it's it is kind of funny with everything this big ramp up and everything and then it's just kind of like okay now we're just doing what we know <laughs> well it's kind of like this has all been such a glorious vesting of you in, yep. the, in, in steeping you in this beauty. And now that quiet part lets you just absorb it. Exactly. You're not on that pinnacle at every moment. Now you can just let it settle in on you. Right. And wrap yourself in it. That's yep. the way I feel about it. No, I, I agree completely. It, it's, it's such a, it, you just kind of take a breath. <sighs> you know, <laughs> here we are. We've done it. <laughs> We've done it. We, we've reached that. We that made it another year. <laughs> moment of glory. Um, one thing I saw once, and I mean, again, this isn't liturgical, but I, I love the symbolism of it, even if it's, again, not, not by the rubrics, and I'm not encouraging people to do it, but there was a parish that I was involved in where they did the first half of the Easter vigil in the evening. So up to the glory to God but not including it. So the, hmm. up to the first seven readings. And then they stopped and prayed the Psalms throughout the night. All of them, all 150 Psalms. Wow. And, and then in the morning, joined together again for the glory to God and the remainder of the Easter vigil. And it'd be, you know, it was like five o'clock in the morning or something like that. So that the Easter vigil would be done by, before sunrise. And I, 
I'm I'm saying don't do it because it is it's against the liturgy. Not correct. It's not correct. You're, you know, it. But it, I love the, the the symbolism of it as well. You know, it, it's one of those things where you're not supposed to put the liturgy on hold. It's not like a VCR where you can pause it and come back to it later. Um, but that that idea though of that waiting all all night for that moment is also kind of, you know, kind of joining ourselves to the apostles. And we can kind of, you know, think about that as we're in the liturgy, you know, as it's going through the readings, this we're waiting, we're with the apostles, something's happening, but we don't know what we're waiting. And then it happens with the glory to God. And then we go forward from there. Right. You know. Well, I know in some parishes they have an, a, a, a uh, sunrise service, mm-hmm. uh, and even in other traditions, uh, not Catholic, Roman right. Catholic traditions. But there's in that waiting through the night and having that liturgy at sunrise. Yep. Uh, I never made it, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but I've I've heard that it's 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 not as intense as the vigil. No. But for those people who can't make the vigil, it is a very meaningful thing yeah. too. Well, and it's, I think it could be, you know, to have a lauds service, a morning prayer service before the, um, on Easter Sunday, again, would be a very powerful thing, uh, worth considering. Right. You know, so, um, but a lot of parishes don't, again, you know, the priests are tired. <laughs> they get oh, done with yeah. the Easter vigil yeah. at 10 o'clock, 11 o'clock, midnight in some cases. And then they have to get up the next morning and do all the Easter Sunday masses. Yes. And that's when we really wished we could have had a, 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 a set of hammocks. Yeah. You know, to bring in. But we typically uh, have a, um, a brass ensemble and right. timpani join us on sure. Easter morning. Sure. And it is, again, it is a lot of joyful noise. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. And that's, that's a wonderful thing. Uh, to to have that to have that proclamation and joy and celebration because of course that's then Easter Sunday is Sunday Mass you know that's that again that's kind of the funny thing is Easter Sunday Masses are just the Mass they're really unless maybe again there's a, you know some parishes like I've done it where if I don't have people coming to the church I'll just do like children's ba- infant baptism on Easter Sunday right you know. But other than that, it's just kind of a normal, glorious, joyful Sunday Mass. You know, and it's, again, it's telling the story of our Lord has risen. You know, we're thanks be to God, our Lord has risen. And you have different Gospels for the different, yes. for the evening than you do in the daytime Masses, too. Yeah, yeah, there's, same like Christmas, there's, there's different, I think, I want to say Easter has two options for, for Easter Sunday. You know, of course, you've got the, the vigil. Gospel, and then there's a, a sunrise, you know, at, at dawn, gospel, right. set of readings, and then during the day. Right. Yeah, we usually do the during the day ones. Right. Yeah. See, what I, a lot of times what I'll do, like what I'll probably do this, this Easter is, of course, the vigil, do the vigil readings. My first mass is at 830 at one of the missions. I'll do the dawn reading there and then do the at the day at the other two masses at the other two parishes. Right. You know, just. Because I, I like, I love that symbolism of, you know, this is because the reading again talks about, you know, it's the morning, they're going to the tomb, what happened? You know, so it's, 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 again, it, it's such a powerful, powerful time and so moving, the whole thing. And then Easter Sunday afternoon, all the priests go back to their rectory and collapse. <laughs> <laughs> Take a nap. <laughs> Take a nap. Yeah. So don't don't be offended. You know, if you if you go ask your priest, you know, would you like to come over for Easter Sunday dinner? Don't be offended if he says, you know, the only thing I want to do this afternoon is go home and sleep. <laughs> sure. Yeah. But no. Wow. Well, do you have anything else you want to say about Easter Sunday or any of the Triduum? We kind of rushed through the whole Holy Week, and you know, we talked about an hour, but still, that was kind of a rush through with the the whole events. Well. One of the things that I like to do during Holy Week and usually on Good Friday, but if depending upon, I will usually try to take some time out. And I happen to like The Passion of the Christ by Mel Gibson. Oh, beautiful. And it really puts you into the, this is what he did. Yep. And so 
Before that, I would listen to Jesus Christ Superstar. Oh, there you go. You know, the, the, the rock musical, because again, it was like I had seen, the, seen it done on stage. Mm-hmm. And I found, even though there were parts that were not exactly liturgical or theologically correct, <laughs> it, it put me into the mind of being there. Right, right. And it was a meditation. And then on Saturday morning, typically, we usually made Easter eggs then. Oh, cool. And that was, again, the, the symbol of the tomb, the egg, yep. you know, and my daughter does, I, I think, uh, uh, some other things with the children as far as uh, uh, pastries and breads that are Easter breads. Sure. And uh, so as a family, that became a day of very quiet. You didn't do much on Easter, on Saturday. It was a, a time of waiting and uh, getting ready for Easter. So, yeah, that was the only other things I thought about. No, that's cool to, to kind of have the family traditions that prepare for Easter as well. You know, I, I think right. I, I hate to say that, but as Catholics, we don't often really think of how do our traditions link up with what we're celebrating. And I, right. I think we kind of we, we've kind of lost a lot of that, you know, in, in the church as a whole that. You know, Sunday should be, you know, what we do it on Sunday should link to the fact we've gone to mass. What we do during Christmas should link to the fact we celebrate our Lord's birth at Christmas. What we do in Easter should, uh, throughout the Triduum, should link to what we're doing liturgically as well. You know. Well, and on Easter dinner, I typically make a leg of lamb. Oh, because, yes. again, to me, that is symbolic and as well as tasty. Oh, and yes. I only do it once a year. Oh, yes. <laughs> so, uh, you know, having the lamb out and uh, that that just brings me back to why are we here? Wonderful. Wonderful. That's that's awesome. That's some good. Good thoughts. Ham doesn't work as well. <laughs> I yeah. mean, it, it does food wise, oh, but yeah. not symbolically. Oh, yeah. It is kind of interesting how ham has kind of become the traditional Easter dinner. I know. And I'm not I, complaining. I, I, really... I, love a, I love a good ham, you know. <laughs> But yeah, I'd like to hear, uh, you know, asking the listeners, I'd love to hear some of your traditions for the, the, the Triduum. Uh, you send us an email at let's talk at sqpn.com. Let us know. I'd love to hear some of what you do during this time. Uh, so, well, now that we've, we've talked about that for quite a while, let's switch over to our picks of the week. Uh, do you have a pick for us or? Yes. And I know it's at the end of Lent here, but uh, I was told about a book of Lenten meditations by an artist who lives here in, in the Austin area. And so I ordered them and it's a beautiful booklet uh, Mm. for, for the 40 days of Lent. And with every day he has a different painting. He has done a scripture reading, a meditation, and then a prayer. Oh, wow. And it's, it's a beautiful book. And uh, I'll put, I'll send you the the link so you can put it in the show notes. Okay. But I bought three of them, one for each of my my girls and myself. Okay. And uh, actually, uh, for one of my sons as well. Sure. Uh, but the 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 paintings are just glorious, uh, right. colorful, very much in the. I don't know what what tradition it is, but it's mm-hmm. very 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 colorful, and the meditations are all very sound. Good. So what's what's the name of it? Lenten Meditations by James B., and I guess it's Jagnet, J-A-N-K-N-E-G-T. And uh, as I say, I'll, I'll, I'll put where you can order that one uh, Excellent. in the notes. Excellent. Yeah, we'll have to make sure that gets in there where you can, you can uh, click on the link and, and order it, and, and that'll be a good thing. Yeah, look forward to seeing it. You know, if nothing else, obviously, you know, we are at the end of Lent, but it's something you could look at throughout the year. It's something you could store till next year. Uh, and if you wanted something for right now, there actually is a Kindle book that I've been using that the particular author has a season of ordinary time. Okay. Easter and Holy Week or Holy Week and Easter. And then uh, one for Christmas and what she does is she takes literary poetry, short stories, things like that, excellent. and then a prayer. Oh, excellent. And uh, I'll, I'll, I'm trying to remember what her name is. I thought I had it written down. Oh. I want to say Susan Anthony or Susan Arthur, I think it is. Okay. But again, uh, I found that 
having that literary tradition, that literary ed, uh, inspiration was yeah, really nice, not just uh, 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 secular readings. Yeah, you'll, you'll definitely have to, again, you send that on. We'll make sure that's in the, the, the show notes so you can uh, check that out as well. That, thanks. That's another good, right. good option. Yeah, and that one, especially because she's got, she does have, you could get right now, the, the Holy Week and, and uh, Easter section. Actually, yeah, that would be, that'd be great uh, for doing this year. Excellent. So my pick uh, is something, again, for preparation for Holy Week. Um, as I, I more than hinted, I made it clear, you know, we really should receive the sacrament of confession. If you haven't during Lent, especially, now would be a good time to do it. Um, and hopefully your parish is, is doing as I'm trying to do, which is make it more available during this time, uh, because, you know, people are busy and everything. But so my pick is actually the examination of conscience for adults and teens by the Fathers of Mercy. This is one that I personally use. Uh, I, I keep copies of it in our parish. We give them away. They're, they're cheap. Uh, you can order your parish can order them or you can order them for your parish, uh, you know, like in packs of 100 for like 12 bucks or something like that. They're not very expensive at all. And uh, they're very nice little pamphlets. They've got not just do they have the an actual examination of conscience. You know, did I do this? Did I do that? Did I not do this? Did I not do that? They also have how to go to confession. They've got, of course, the act of contrition, the prayer before and after confession. They've got uh, the Ten Commandments, different things to reflect on, precepts of the church. Uh, they've got the capital sins, the capital virtues, the sins against theological virtues, and all these things to reflect on, the works of mercy and all that. Because, of course, you know, when we go to confession, it's not just what did I do? Well, I beat up my brother and sister, and I was... Taught, you know, I didn't listen to my parents, you know, the ones we always get from kids. You know, I didn't listen to my parents, didn't listen to my teachers. But also, what didn't I, what did I not do that I should have done? The sins of commission and the sins of omission. You know, and so it goes through all of that. And it's very in-depth, but very clear, too. And so it's a beautiful, uh, beautiful um, pamphlet for Again, just reflecting on our, our lives and full, bringing to the fullness what we've done that we, we need to seek God's mercy for. So I encourage you, um, you can go to their website. And again, we'll have a link in the show notes where you can download it. You don't even have to buy it. You can do, they, they put it out there free of charge that you can just download and print it to a letter sized sheet of paper. Or like I said, you can order packets and give them to your pastor, give them to your your whoever's in charge of the pamphlet rack in the back of the church. Every church has it. Um, and so they can be put out for people to use. So again, check that out. The, the examination of conscience by the Fathers of Mercy. And you know, of course, if you watch EWTN, you've seen the Fathers of Mercy. They're on there all the time. You know that, again, very solid, very faithful priests. Very good. Yes. Well, thank you very much, Pat, for uh, joining us. Where can people find you if they want to hear more from you? Oh, I've got a website. Uh, it's the-mama-nerd.com. <laughs> nice. I also have a Facebook page. Uh, so if you're on Facebook, it's uh, a, a public page. And again, it's facebook.com backslash the-mama-nerd. I think there's another dash in there too. Yeah, the-mama-nerd. Nice. Okay. And of course, we can find you on Secrets of Technology as well. Yes. <laughs> Got to make sure to promote that as well. And I'm Father Corey Stika. You can find me at my website where I post my homilies, frcorey.org. Uh, of course, you can find me on Secrets of Technology, Secrets of Doctor Who, Secrets of Star Trek here on SQPN. Uh, my Facebook page is Father Corey Stika, all spelled out. My uh, Twitter handle is frcoreystika. If you have any feedback about this episode of Let's Talk or any episode of Let's Talk, you can send it to Let's Talk at SQPN.com. Thank you very much for listening. God bless and may you have a very blessed Triduum and a happy Easter. <laughs> <laughs>